Free to play games make a lot of money. Games like Fortnite, TF2, and even Roblox probably come to mind. Microtransactions like V-Bucks and Robux have long been associated with these games as well. Some can make the argument that free to play games aren't that bad, and most people just spend the same amount of money on paid games anyways. But as someone who's spent over $300 on Fortnite over the years, yeah, not proud of that. It's definitely the most I've ever spent on a video game. And while the last video just had me playing some free games and having fun with it, this time I really want to go into detail about the monetization of free to play. Or as I'm once again calling it, free to pay. And look, there's a little two as well. As while these games are more accessible than ever, they're also more profitable than standard releases from a business perspective. I'd say the origins of free to play all started with the shareware of the early 90s. It was basically a game demo, which you'd only be allowed to run for a specific amount of time at once, before being forced to either restart or go out and buy the full version. This was effective as a demo, as the potential player base could get a feel for the game before paying full price for it. A much better system than what was common at the time, buying the game solely based off of the cover where the actual game could turn out to be horrible, and players would have an overall worse experience because of it. This was especially bad on early consoles, when game covers looked nothing like the actual games. But even then, this is less free to play and more like free to try, a game demo, or a demo disc, rather than an actual game. But a major innovation would be made many years later by Valve. While they're often praised for their innovations in FPS game design, virtual reality, and digital game stores, something I don't see being talked about nearly as often is their pioneering of the free-to-play games model. While free-to-play games existed before, Valve would be the ones to really usher in a new era. Team Fortress 2 was released in October 2007 with a price tag of about $20, or $50 if you got it from its inclusion in the orange box. While the game itself also contained a ton of innovations, pretty much establishing class-based FPS multiplayer games as a subgenre, its business model was pretty milquetoast. But this would all change in May 2009, when hats were added into the game. And with the launch of crates in September 2010's Manconomy update, the game would make more money than ever before. Unusual hats with special effects and particles were added into the game. And with an introduction to a community market, where hats, crates, weapons, taunts, and paints could be sold for however much the seller chooses to, it created an entire player economy pretty much overnight, in which rare and unusual items with special visuals would be worth more money, and less desirable items could be purchased for cheap. This system was so successful that they actually cut the price from TF2 entirely less than a year later, as the game ended up making more money from microtransactions than it did from game sales. I think it's safe to say they've made the right decision. For what it is, I think this is the best approach for microtransactions, as most things you spend money on are purely cosmetic, with it being entirely possible to both play and win for free. Unless you want to talk in the chat. Because of the influx of bots, there are now two versions of a TF2 account, a free to play and a premium. Basically, if you haven't spent money on the game, then you can't play the game more effectively, since team communication makes planning easier and leads to some of the funniest moments. Because of the effectiveness TF2's system had, CSGO was launched a few months after TF2 went free, and due to its overwhelming success, Valve made the new game free as well. This one follows a very similar system, but with a lot more varieties in weapon wear and specific patterns. This means that prices could become higher and higher, and boy they did. The most expensive TF2 item is the Burning Flames Team Captain, with an estimated value of $15,000. To compare, the most expensive expensive CSGO item is a factory new case-hardened blue gem karambit, and if you couldn't understand all that, it's basically a really nice looking knife. The owner was offered one and a half million dollars for it, only for the owner to turn it down because the price was too low. So while these two games cost the same price up front, which is nothing, the latter is a whole lot more profitable, 
And I know some more experienced Counter-Strike skin buyers are questioning how Valve is making money off of these trades, since they make no direct profit from that. Well, that's because of the amount of loot boxes opened by people actively trying to get something of a similar value. But because of all the specific factors, getting an identical or more valuable knife might as well be impossible. But that's not stopping players from trying. Oh yeah, this game also has a community store. But while these monetization methods have been working for Valve, they came up with an entire new one in another game by them, Dota 2. Dota is the first game to have established a battle pass, known at the time as the International 2013 Interactive Compendium. And while I wasn't able to see it firsthand, because I was a, a little late, looking at archives of the first compendium, it wasn't really that comparable to a battle pass. It allowed players to make predictions on esports, and would even unlock some select exclusives through the tier system, which are tied to monetary stretch goals. However, it was very different from what we describe today as a battle pass. While there's both a paid and free tier set to limited time to induce the fear of missing out. The next year, more battle pass elements would begin to take form, with challenges giving special compendium points for players to progress through 100 levels, giving out exclusive items, all for only $10. Starting to sound a little more familiar. 2016 was when the term Battle Pass would finally be used, to replace the compendium. The thing that made these passes better than, say, loot boxes, which Dota also has, is how much you're getting for what you pay for. Buying characters, on the other hand, is expensive, and can possibly lead to a direct advantage if the character's high on the tier list. Late that next year, the Battle Pass would see its most famous modern appearance, in Fortnite Battle Royale, which would further cement it as a profitable source of income for free games. Something cool it did was give the players an amount of V-Bucks in both the free and paid Battle Pass, allowing players to only pay $10 for every Battle Pass, so long as they play the game and use the Battle Pass V-Bucks on the next one when it comes around. This free versus paid design also seems to have been created by Epic, and is the first thing many think of when the term Battle Pass is brought up. And in Fortnite, this is paired with the much more lucrative method, the item shop, where players can spend big dollars on singular skins. While its main purpose is to make money directly, it also serves a side purpose of encouraging people to buy the Battle Pass. Why spend $20 for one skin when you can spend $8 to buy a Battle Pass with 100 tiers, including multiple skins you could only get for a limited time? While the game has numerous avenues for making money, the silver lining is that, by all intents and purposes, the game still stays equal to all, not giving any direct advantages. All of the games mentioned so far follow a similar pattern of microtransactions in order to buy items. This next game takes things to quite the extreme. I want to talk about the most popular free-to-play games uh, around. Roblox. Love it or hate it, for me it's closer to the latter, the system around Roblox is pretty genius. But also potentially scummy, Roblox isn't a free-to-play game, but a free-to-play platform, where different developers create different experiences, with the profits of the young developers being split with the platform. I'm not sure how scummy of a choice this is on the company's part, because I couldn't find an exact percentage of how much they take, but other creators have made videos on that specific thing. No. What I'm gonna point towards is show how greedy some of these games can be. I'm sympathetic for the Roblox game devs to a degree. Get your bag, or whatever. But at the very least, I want to see some actual effort put into a game instead of just copying some levels to make an obby or escape game. And spam pop-up ads to get little children to pay for random items in games they'll never touch again. Alternatively, you can get things from the cosmetic store like me. What can I say? I thought the emoji was funny. <laughs> so far we've had free-to-play games using various types of monetization schemes, like microtransactions, loot boxes, skins, etc. But for our last game, let's take a look at something that doesn't have any monetization. Objectively the best for the player, but the worst for the developer, at least from a financial standpoint. Undertale was a pretty great game. 
its main draw being the multitude of endings and freedom to choose between sparing or killing the monsters of the underground. Deltarune doesn't have those, until it does, but the coolest thing about Deltarune is that, in its current state, the game's completely free. The first two chapters contain hours worth of content with the same writing style and charming characters that made Undertale so special. But something Deltarune does unintentionally is work as a great pitch for why people who weren't familiar with Undertale should give it a buy. But at the end of the day, Deltarune is a demo, with the full version costing money once enough chapters are released. Hey, would you look at that? Here are just some of the common methods free-to-play games make their money. While the first video was honestly just an excuse to check out some of the games following the model, this one served a purpose of explaining the monetization itself. And while I doubt I covered everything, because there's a lot of different ways to make money, I hope I at least covered some bases here, instead of missing surface level elements of the games. Uh, bye!